Let's pray together. O oh, Jesus, Lamb of God, You are worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because You were slain and purchased for God with Your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And You made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. You are worthy, O oh Jesus, for you were slain. You are worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. To you, O oh God, who sit on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We join our voices to these great songs these songs that heaven will sing. We join our voices to the angels and to the uncountable redeemed, to the four living creatures and 24 elders in a chorus of praise that you alone are worthy to receive. We're thankful for the promises of a new day coming, for the resurrection of the dead, and for light to replace darkness. God, as we look to your word today, I pray that you would fill our hearts with hope who love you. And for those who are here this morning who do not yet know your love, we pray that this would be a day of salvation. We ask for your help to understand your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8, and we will continue our study verse by verse through this book. The section we are in details the outpouring of God's wrath against the recalcitrant, rebellious, unrepentant world. A code name for the people on the earth who don't love God in this book is the earth dwellers. The earth dwellers. Revelation 6 through 19 details a series of judgments from God against the earth dwellers that detail the future literal history of this world. The last three weeks we observed in Revelation 7 the mercy of God in the midst of wrath. There will be a period of time where the darkest days of earth are experienced and yet during that time God will save sinners. In the worst hours of the world's history, there is an interlude of grace, a, a breaking in of mercy in the midst of wrath, an interruption to the breaking of the seals in that scroll. In chapter 6, we saw six seals broken and the six judgments that those seals detail poured out on the earth. That's six out of seven. There is one left to go. And in that break in between the sixth and seventh seals, we saw that there will be 144,000 Jewish males to begin a massive harvest of faith during that world's darkest hour. Those 144,000 are followed by an uncountable number of redeemed people from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. That uncountable number will depart the great tribulation by death. We got to see their home going last week and their joy in heaven at the end of chapter 7. And there will be others, objects of mercy from all of the nations who also will believe the gospel during that time, and they will remain on the earth through severe difficulty, and they will enter the kingdom when Jesus returns in Revelation 19 and 20. The last three weeks were a respite from wrath, a depiction of God's unbelievable mercy, an interlude of grace, and it's a window into God's heart that even at this age, when the world is at its darkest, when rebellion is at its height, when the human population becomes unified in a solidarity of sin, like a new tower of Babel raising itself against God, even in that time, the worst of times, God will still save sinners out of darkness and out of their rebellion. In Revelation chapter 8, however, the interlude is over. 
We see in the text before us this morning the continuing of the seven seals judgments. There is one last seal to break on this scroll, one final judgment to reveal. This morning we're looking at Revelation chapter 8 and the first six verses. Look down at your Bibles and read this with me. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints out of the angel's hand before God. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. What is this passage all about? The wrath of God will resume with the opening of the seventh seal revealing five ominous sights in heaven. The wrath of God will resume as this seventh seal is opened. And as this seal is opened, we see five ominous scenes in heaven. The first sight we come across in verse 1 is a stunning silence. We know that the scroll has seven seals. We discovered that only Jesus could break the seals and unroll unroll the scroll one judgment at a time. The opening of the scroll brings the execution of the judgment, one sealed section after another. And we have seen six of them. We're waiting for the final seal to be broken. And tension mounts in heaven as heaven waits for the seventh seal. At the end of chapter 6, we discovered the earth dwellers crying out, Who can stand now that the wrath of God has come? In fact, they cried out for the rocks to fall on them and crush them, rather than soften their hearts toward God in repentance. In chapter 7, verse 1, four angels stopped all the winds on the earth from blowing. Dramatic meteorological situation, a pause. In chapter 7, we saw, four, we saw groups of people who actually will withstand the judgment of God. Who can stand when God judges? The forgiven is the answer. Those declared righteous by His grace through the gospel, the objects of God's mercy, those who respond in faith to Jesus Christ, they actually will stand in the judgment of God. But now there is this expectation The wind is stopped, the slaves of God are sealed, and we have chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Heaven is in stunned silence. What does half an hour feel like? When I read this a few moments ago, I paused for about half a minute It seemed interminable to me. Sometimes a half hour can fly by. Sometimes it seems to go on forever. It depends on what's happening. When someone is not breathing, maybe when you're waiting in a courtroom for a verdict to be read. Maybe you drive through a tunnel. If you're at the wheel, you you call out tunnel and everybody in the car has to hold their breath for the entirety of the time you're in the tunnel. Am I the only one that does this? You do this too? I'm about to reveal a secret to my own children from up front. I'm in charge of the gas pedal. I know how long I can hold my breath. Sometimes I slow down. (laughs) 
Can you imagine this scene in heaven? For about a half an hour, it is pin drop silent. This is not normal. We've already seen the scenes here, four living beings ceaselessly crying out, holy, holy, holy. 24 elders around the throne crying out, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and because of your will they existed and they were created. Chapter 4, verse 11. In chapter 5, we discover John the Apostle was crying greatly and an elder said, stop crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah can open the scroll. The four living beings and the 24 elders sang, Revelation 5, 9, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. You were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then you get the myriads and myriads, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, that's 404 million at the bare mathematical minimum, of angels joining in the cacophony. Revelation 5.12, they cry out, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Nobody has ever heard 404 million supernatural beings singing the same thing at the same time. And then in verse 13 of chapter 5, everyone joins in. They were saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living beings kept on saying, Amen. And as the six seals are opened, during the first four, the the four living beings call out, Come, bring it on. And then the martyrs cry out with a loud voice during the fifth seal in Revelation 6.10. They sing, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And in chapter 7, another angel cried out with a loud voice, Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the slaves of God. And then the great multitude sings out in unison, Revelation 7.10, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. After that, the angels, the four living beings, and the elders worshipped God, and they said, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then we saw one of the elders in a Q&A with John. Who are these people? You know, and he describes them. In chapter 4, there's thunder. In chapter 6, there's a great cosmic shaking. Heaven has been noisy. But now, heaven waits in stunned silence for the opening of the final seal. What could possibly silence the songs of heaven? The redeemed, the angels, the heavenly creatures, the great choruses and the cacophony of heavenly throng all comes to a halt. Nobody speaks. Not a sound is heard. All attention is focused on what will happen next in the dread and anticipation. This is an ominous scene. It is the dread of holiness breaking out against an unrepentant world. If the first six seals were that bad, what will the seventh bring? The Apostle Paul instructing Christians in Romans 12, 19 says, Don't take vengeance, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath. And here, it's as if heaven is making room for the wrath. Everybody there steps back in stunned silence waiting to see what will take place next. And there's a second ominous sight. It's in verse 2. Trumpet-wielding angels. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. What cataclysm is this seventh seal, this last seal judgment? What will it bring to the earth? Apparently, this is not just one judgment that comes out of this seventh seal, but seven more judgments. John sees seven angels with seven trumpets, and the message is, we're not done yet. The content of the seventh seal is seven trumpet judgments, seven more judgments. 
a series of seven sets of cataclysms emerging from this final seal judgment. It's like those Russian nesting dolls. Hey, what's that doll all about? Open it up and there's seven more inside. Notice there's no plague or horsemen or ecological disaster associated with the opening of the final seal. The content of the seventh seal is a new batch of judgments. And the same phenomenon will occur again at the seventh trumpet judgment. When the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet, there will be a final series of judgments described as bowl judgments that come out of the seventh trumpet. The content of the seventh trumpet will be seven more judgments. So in one sense, everything that follows between here and chapter 19 is the content of the seventh seal. Out of the seventh seal come seven trumpet judgments. Out of the seventh trumpet judgment come seven bowl judgments. There are interludes between these things. We'll see them as we walk through the book. They're interesting pictures. Wax seals on a rolled scroll must be broken in order to reveal. Trumpets are sounded so as to alarm. And bowls contain the fullness of God's wrath for the very end of the age. And they are poured out. The seals reveal, the trumpets alarm, and the bowls overwhelm. All of this in an increasing severity as it approaches the end. The effect of these telescoping judgments... You get to the last one in a series, and the last one reveals seven more. The effect on us as readers is the sobering heaviness of the judgment of God that's coming to the earth. We get to the end of the series, and we discover, wait, there, there's more? And the effect of these telescoping judgments on those who will dwell on the earth at that time will be absolutely devastating. Those who survive each danger will only have to face more terror. And one might hope that if I can just make it through this next disaster, everything's going to be okay. Listen, nobody will be making life as good stickers anymore. Everything's not going to be okay. Hopes will be dashed again and again as the judgments get more and more severe. For thousands of years, God has been patient with a rebellious humanity. But in one seven-year period of time, he will unleash justice in an accelerating train of judgment. We see these seven angels. We notice in Scripture that God has different angels for different purposes. There are varieties of angels, ranks of angels. There are personalities amongst angels. Angels have different responsibilities. They are called in Hebrews 1.14, ministering spirits. Remember that angels are not graduated humans, not Clarence from that movie when the angel gets his wings because a bell rings. Angels are a different class of being than humans. They are loyal servants of God. They are sinless. And they experience no redemption. They have not needed to be saved. These holy angels in heaven have belonged to God for all time and they've never sinned. Angels in Daniel 4 are called watchers. Jesus spoke about angels interestingly in Matthew 18. He said, don't harm my precious followers. Why? Because they have their angels in heaven who are continually before the face of my Father who is in heaven. It's an interesting connection between the Christian life here and God's ministering spirits who are said to serve the elect while they're on the earth. Of course, we entertain angels unawares. We don't know who they are or when they serve us, but this is their fundamental purpose. We have in Revelation 1 to 3 those angels of the churches that have some interaction with local bodies of believers on the earth. There are two named angels in the Bible. We could assume that all the angels have names, but we only learn two of them in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. Michael is called an archangel in Jude 9. He's called the chief prince in Daniel 12. And in Revelation 12, he is said to command an army of angels in a heavenly war against evil angels or demons. The other named angel is Gabriel. He appeared to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 and 9 to tell Daniel what would happen at the end times. He, he shows up in the end time scenes in Daniel. Gabriel shows up in the end time scenes in Revelation. 
And then Gabriel, as you know, appeared to Zacharias. That was the father of John the Baptist. Told Zacharias he would have a son, and that son would point to Christ. And he said to Zacharias, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. That seems to be a unique designation of this Gabriel. A a presence angel, if you will. One whose unique station in the service of God is to be close to the throne, ready at God's hand to do his bidding. In Luke 26, Gabriel was sent from God to speak with Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus. And here in Revelation 7, you have the seven angels who are said to stand in the presence of God. Because Gabriel is described that way, maybe he's one of these seven. Angels in the Bible have been called hosts. That is a word that just simply means armies. And now angels will engage in warfare against earth's rebels. They hold trumpets, according to verse 2. A trumpet is a distinctive, loud instrument. Right? Don't think of the mellow, muted, jazz trumpet on the corner of some street in New Orleans. Um, think of the trumpets at Jericho with the crystal clear, brassy, blazing clarion call. The trumpets were used for announcements and proclamations, for solemn assemblies. Trumpets were used as a call to war. The Old Testament prophets described trumpets announcing end times judgments. That's what we see here. It is the clarion blast of a trumpet summoning our attention. And the angels whose job it will be to execute these judgments will announce each one with a loud, clear blast of the trumpet. Here in verse 3, they are seen standing in God's presence, trumpets in hand. Three angels are, these angels are stationed in readiness to execute the next series of judgments against the world. There is a third ominous scene in the opening of the seventh seal. And it is prayer that is pleasing to God in his throne room. Verses three and four. We read, another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints out of the angel's hand before God. We have here another angel with another task. And he stands at the altar. This is the altar mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation. It is the altar of incense. It is a tangible emblem of prayer. It's filled with aromatic spices, incenses, plural, that when burned, fill the space with a pleasing aroma. This is a visible expression of of worship that's pleasing to God. The angel is said here to hold a censer. That's uh, that's just some sort of container holding incense uh, that is being heated up, uh, held next to burning coals, and when it is next to the fire, it emits this aromatic smoke. Perhaps this sensor is something like a fire pan, something that could carry burning coals. And so the incense is placed on the burning coals and it produces this smoke that rises up before the throne of God. This altar of incense and the fire pan are made of gold, according to this text, that indicates the purity and the beauty and the value of their purpose and of their contents. And notice verse 3. John records, much incense was given. Literally, many more incenses were added. They were added to the prayers of the saints. We learn in chapter 5 that the prayers of the saints are before the Lord in heaven in golden bowls. And they go up as a pleasing aroma before Him. And, And here in this scene, heaven adds its own incenses to the stores of believers' prayers. And all of it goes up as a pleasing aroma to God. I believe the addition of this heavenly incense is an indication that heaven endorses earthly prayers and that when believers pray, God adds to the pleasing aroma of it. But we know that when believers pray, they have intercessors, that is, go-betweens. The the two intercessors are listed for us in Romans chapter 8. The first is the Lord Jesus Christ 
who intercedes at the right hand of God on behalf of us related to sin. Now we have an advocate before the Father. How can Jesus be an advocate for us sinners in the holy presence of his Father? Because he went to the cross and paid for every single sin, past, present, and future, of everyone who would ever believe when he died on the cross. He paid a one-for-one correspondence between our crimes and the demands of holy justice. And he said in the conclusion of his death on the cross, it is finished. He wasn't talking merely about his earthly life, but talking about the great transaction that he purchased as a substitute. The transaction where believers' sins get credited to Christ's account in his punishment under holy justice. And Christ's righteousness gets credited to believers' account to give us a perfect standing before a holy God. It's the gospel. It's the good news. He is our intercessor so that when believers pray, the sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, and God hears our prayers. And the second intercessor listed in Romans 8 is the Holy Spirit who adjusts our prayers according to the will of God as we pray them. We don't know how we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit helps our weakness. In fact, He intercedes on our behalf, according to Romans 8, with groans deeper than words. And He knows our hearts, and He knows the will of God, and He makes it match. He fixes our prayers on the way up. So when the prayers of the saints end up in heaven, they are flawless, acceptable, pleasing to Him. And God heaps on to that more which pleases Him. It's a reminder that everything is from Him and through Him and to Him. There's nothing good that we would bring into heaven that He Himself does not produce. It's just grace upon grace. This also means there is no wasted prayer. Every time a believer from the heart cries out, help, acknowledges God, expresses love, however feebly, it is worship before God. The scene is an inducement to us to pray. It's an encouragement to us to pray, to pray more, to pray better. And notice verse 3, John says, these are the prayers of all the saints, I think this is an indication that the prayers indicated here are not merely the prayers of the martyrs that we saw under the fifth seal judgment. It indicates to us that the collection of prayer represents the heartfelt Godward longings of believers from every age. It includes those tribulation martyrs who cried out, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? But it includes all those who have been joined to God by faith. Throughout salvation history, God's people have prayed to God from a hostile world, from difficult circumstances, in hope and trust and eager expectation, in longing. Genesis 4.10 records this, Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. From the very beginning of the fall of man, you have murder and sin and violence and corruption in the earth. And yet there is this longing from a world of brokenness up to heaven's throne room. Deuteronomy 32, 43 says this, For God will avenge the blood of His servants, and He will render vengeance on His adversaries, and He will atone for His land and His people. That's a promise from the Old Testament that has still not yet been fulfilled. And so as we wait, as we trust, as we hope, there is this pent-up longing. Listen to Asaph's psalm, Psalm 79. O God, he sings, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the dead bodies of your servants for food to the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your godly ones to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water round about Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and derision to those around us. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? 
pour out your wrath upon the nations which do not know you and upon the kingdoms which do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. Let your compassion come quickly to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. And deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight vengeance for the blood of your servants which has been shed. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. According to the greatness of your power, preserve those who are doomed to die. And return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom the reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. To all generations, we will tell of your praise. Not all of us have faced the difficulties that Asaph reflects in that song. But every Christian knows what it means to have been part of the system, a system of darkness and slavery leading to death, then to have been rescued out of it but to still live in the midst of it. Produces a groaning, a homelessness, a restlessness. We see in this scene in Revelation 7, our prayers purified, multiplied, amplified in heaven. Our prayers are heard and treasured and accepted. They please the Lord of heaven as acceptable worship. And as we will see, they are effectual. God is about to answer the cry for justice, the longing for vindication, the satisfaction of hope. He's going to satisfy the creation's groaning. He's going to answer the disciples' prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The implication of that prayer that Jesus' followers are supposed to be praying is that the kingdom is not yet here and God's will is not yet done on the earth. That produces a yearning, a longing in us for these things to be. Why is this scene of prayer ominous? Because God has heard the groanings of His people. They are precious to Him, and He will answer. It's ominous because it is not good news for a world stubbornly resisting the love of God. While they spurn His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness available in Christ... They choose to run their own course away from God and away from His goodness. And now, in answer to the prayers of His people, the groaning of creation and the culture of heaven, God will vindicate His own name and He will rescue the earth back from the squatters and the usurpers who hate Him. There's a fourth ominous sight in this scene. A fiery forecast. Look at verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. This is a surprising transition at the altar of incense. We go from prayer and the coals there were designed to heat up the incense and send smoke before God as a pleasing aroma, and here the coals of that fire are hurled earthward. This is an ominous sign of greater judgments coming. Fire hurled down from the altar after the silence in heaven depicts the severity of the cataclysms yet to come. What's interesting here is this altar is pleasing to God in the throne room of God. It is pleasing to Him that sinners would pray and receive mercy. It's also pleasing to God that unrepentant sinners would be punished. Does this seem out of character? Is this some uncontrolled outburst? Has God lost his cool? Is there something wrong with God? Is, I thought God was a God of love. What is this fire thrown down from heaven? This is God's holiness in the presence of sin. This is justice. This is not the opposite of good. This is actually what good does. God is love. 
God loves what is good. God's judgment against sin is actually the expression of his beauty and goodness and love and excellencies bursting forth against darkness and hate and sin and ugliness. We know in an earthly courtroom, a a judge is not considered to be a good judge if he lets the murderer of innocence go free. It's actually the definition of a bad judge. Here, God's goodness in the presence of recalcitrant sin is seen in terms of judgment. What has held back this judgment all this time? Mercy. Mercy has held it back. This is why Paul says in Romans 2, when we sin, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. God's mercy holds it back for a time, like a dam holding back a great body of water. Someday the dam will release. The water will flood out. God's judgment will go forward, as it should. Listen, it's a strange thing to say as a sinner who has offended God in infinite measure. I deserved that judgment. I earned that judgment. And God was merciful to me. And if you are in Christ, you you have this same strange experience of saying, yes, God, be just. And if I had called out for God's justice while I was in unbelief, I would have been dead. This is not strange to God. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 12. Jesus, while he was here the first time, said, I have come to cast fire on the earth, Luke 12, 49. And how I wish it were already kindled. But, Jesus says, I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed of soul am I until it is accomplished. What is Jesus saying? It is right in the character of Jesus to wish that heaven's fire would be kindled against a rebellious world. That's appropriate. But, and this is great big contrast of grace in the Bible, it's right for justice to come down in fire on the earth, but, Jesus says, I have a baptism, an immersion to undergo. What would Jesus be immersed under? That same fiery wrath. He would endure it in his own person as our substitute at the cross. He went to immerse himself in his own death under the holy wrath of God. And he said, I am distressed of soul until that is accomplished. What do we see in our Savior? Holy justice, ready to be kindled and mercy and love to save every sinner who will come to him by faith. There's no one like our God. There is no one like Jesus. The Century Program is a program of the California Institute of Technology and Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena. They have established the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, and they monitor space for objects that pose a potential risk of colliding with the Earth. Have you looked at their list of space objects? It's interesting. The Century Program currently lists 28 objects in space that it monitors and considers to pose a real threat to life on Earth in the next 100 years. And so they list these objects by name. They're not interesting names. It's like SG-344. And they list them by size. For instance, uh, one kilometer in diameter. They list them by the range of years or the individual year that it could hit the earth. One of these asteroids, for instance, has the possibility of hitting the earth sometime in its rotations between 2035 and 2122 and they measure their speed, 35 kilometers a second, for instance. 
And then they also measure the probability of impact. And that is math I will not understand. The Century Program also lists space objects that have been taken off the list. The, the 28 that are currently on the list are interesting. You can find out where they are and what they're doing. But a space rock gets taken off the list if, after monitoring, it becomes clear the rock will not hit the earth. And there are 322 pages of rocks that have been studied, tracked, and taken off the list. 3,211 individual items. Only 28 current. That's good news. Will humanity avoid a doomsday collision with space rocks? Can we miss every asteroid by chance? Or can we send up nukes and lasers to destroy them before they hit us? The answer to that, of course, is no. The earth will not avoid such collisions. And they are not by chance. Extraplanetary objects will most definitely strike the earth on which humanity dwells. When these trumpet judgments unfold, that is exactly what's described. There will be no prevention, no escape. These are God's judgments against a rebellious race, and they are inevitable. The fire hurled from heaven's hearth is an emblematic and ominous preview of the very real and very destructive ecological disasters that are on their way. In Ezekiel 10, we get a similar scene in heaven where uh, in heaven, fire is thrown down from the altar. And that was a heavenly emblem of real events in world history, Babylon's destruction of Jerusalem. In that case, it was an emblem representing other kinds of physical realities. In Exodus chapter 9, however, when Israel was being plucked out of the clutches of Egyptian slavery, there was literal fire from the sky. That's plague number seven on Egypt. And in Genesis 19, of course, there was literal fire from the sky on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Here in Revelation 7, the cataclysms that come will not be localized. It will not just be a portion of Egypt that gets torched, nor just the land, the plain containing the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It will be global. Global catastrophes that lay waste to human civilization. This is signaled in heaven by thunder and sounds and lightning and shaking, according to verse 5. The last word in our English Bible says earthquake. It's not properly an earthquake, it's just seismos. It just means a great shaking. It is likely a great cosmic shaking. The universe trembling at what heaven is about to do. There is a fifth and final ominous sight in heaven at the opening of the seventh seal. Look down at verse 6. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. This is a foreboding preparation. You almost get the scene here that these seven angels in the presence of God holding the seven trumpets now stand in readiness, raise the trumpet to the lips, take a deep angelic breath, and all heaven is about to break loose. And what follows in chapters 8 and 9 and then 11 are four ecological catastrophes, two supernatural attacks, and then seven more judgments called bowl judgments. First trumpet brings hail, fire, and blood, and a third of the earth is burned. The second brings a burning mountain into the sea, a giant rock, and a third of the oceans turn to blood. In verse 10 of chapter 8, the third judgment of trumpets is a burning star out of heaven, some celestial body crashing to the earth, and a third of the fresh waters made bitter. The fourth trumpet judgment is the heavenly lights darkened by a third. The fifth and the sixth trumpet judgments are the onslaughts of demonic hordes unleashed on humanity to engage in physical torment and physical killing of humans on the earth. A third of humanity will die at that point. And then the final trumpet Judgment unleashes seven bowls full of the final wrath of God. I want to say a word this morning about every foolish, about a very foolish way of thinking 
that I think is particular to church-going people who hear these things and they say, you know, I'll take care of that later. Maybe you're in this category. Maybe you're hearing these things and, yeah, that sounds awful. Uh, I don't have good cause to disbelieve the Bible, uh, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait to repent. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to strategize a little bit here. The Bible indicates that God will save people during the great tribulation. I'm going to be one of those people. I'm going to suggest to you this morning that that is not a good bet. To say, I want to live the way I want to live right now, and and when all the bad stuff starts going down, then I'll get my spiritual life arranged. Sin doesn't work that way. You don't get a parachute with the free fall away from the grace of God. You don't get a reset button, some release valve. You don't have control over the hardened condition of your heart when you turn away from the living God. Rebellion doesn't work that way. Hard hearts don't work that way. The Bible indicates a a doctrine that we call judicial hardening. We see this in Romans 1. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over again and again and again. In Exodus, we saw Pharaoh harden his heart and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's no guarantee that you can soften your own heart. If you're unwilling to soften your heart now, I'm not convinced you'll be able to soften your heart then. Jesus himself said, no one comes to me except the Father who draws him. What does that mean? You you don't have the ability in a hard heart to make your heart soft. This is why you cannot put off repentance. If you're feeling conviction over your sin and a wayward life and you recognize God is going to judge the earth, don't wait. You cannot set a timer on your heart to follow God. What is the invitation of the Bible? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your hearts. That's the Bible's invitation. I have a hunch that the great masses of people who will repent during the great tribulation will likely be people who hear the gospel for the first time and believe. I'm not convinced that somebody who hears the gospel over and over and over again and stiffens his uh, stiffens his heart, uh, stiffens his neck, and stiff arms God's grace time after time, we'll have the ability to believe. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59. I want you to see the heart of God here. We think, man, does God have a short fuse? Does He have a short temper? What's going on in the book of Revelation? The prophet Isaiah puts the reality to us. Isaiah 59.1, Behold, the hand of Yahweh is not so short that it cannot save. His ears are not so dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And he goes on and said, your your hands are soaked in blood. You're guilty. Every man, every woman, every child is born sinful by nature. And we incur guilt because we act out of our nature. And there is hope for all who are guilty. There's nobody who, ex- who escapes the charge. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. It is right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give rest to you who are afflicted and to us as well at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, executing vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the reality. Guilty 
as every one of us is. While we have breath on this earth, we have opportunity. You cannot sin deeper or farther or darker than Jesus can pay. We're all in the same category, equalized by sin and separation from God as a result of our sin. And we're all on the same footing with access to the good news that saves. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who went to a cross 2,000 years ago to pay for our sins, to bring us to God. That's our hope. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you do not surrender your holiness or else this world would continue to spin on in deception and darkness and misery and brokenness and rebellion. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have not brought your holiness to bear on this earth just yet. You have been patient. You have been long-suffering. You long to bring all those whom you purchased with your blood to repentance and faith in your grace and love. Thank you for loving us. God, we know that as long as you allow this world to spin with your people, the church still here, you have given us the great task to know you and to make known the unfathomable riches of your grace in Christ. Help us to this end, in Jesus' name. Amen.